Hi everyone, um, just to introduce myself, my name is Donna Lyons, I'm an assistant professor here at Trinity College Dublin Law School. You are very welcome, we're looking forward to an enjoyable, constructive and enriching discussion. We have an excellent lineup of speakers um, covering a number of topics within the broad area of the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on public international law. So exploring, for example, the World Health Organization and challenges that that faces, um, issues around the gendered effects of the pandemic, environmental law, uh, human rights law, distributive justice, and many other topics. So very important current issues facing international law. So I'd like to thank all of the esteemed speakers um, for participating today and to all of the other uh, participants and attendees and we're really looking forward to engaging with you at the questions and answers session. So just to note there are two time slots, so we'll kick off this first time slot now, which will run till two o'clock, and then from two to 4.30, we have a second slot just to accommodate our five speakers who are in the United States and Canada, so they're five hours behind us, and some of the other speakers in that slot um, are replying directly to commentary. By, by those individuals in the other time zone. So we had to divide it up that way. Um, but if, it'd be wonderful if, if uh, as many participants as possible were able to stay for the whole afternoon, it'd be fantastic. Just to note from a technological point of view, if uh, a presenter's screen freezes or the connection goes, we'll just move on to the next speaker. And um, once the, the, uh, the speaker's connection reconnects, we'll go back then to that speaker, if that suits everybody. Um, Yes, yeah, so a lot of good friends, old and new, uh, here on the panel. And I was talking to Juan Mendes on Monday, who was reprimanding me for using too many official titles. So if it suits you, I'll use first names and same and vice versa, obviously, for me. And if anyone has any objections, just let me know now. That's no problem. We did our utmost to create diverse panels. Um, so in terms of the invitations that went out, for example, 50% went out to female academics and 50% went out to, to male academics, but it was striking how many female academics um, and scholars were unable to attend. So it's worth considering to, to what extent that's reflective of broader participation uh, at the international organizations, for example, and that's something that Catherine O'Rourke is gonna talk about in her presentation. So I'm really looking forward to engaging with you on that, Catherine. So finally, just to note that for those of you who are attending today, there is a Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. If you want to ask a question, feel free to write it up in there and we'll keep an eye then on the Q&A um, in the sidebar. Uh, we did get a few questions directly to, to Robert before for today. So we have them lined up. But if you want to ask questions throughout the, the speaker's presentations, just feel free to pop those in the Q&A section there. Um, and just a really big thanks to all of the speakers, to all of the audience members who could attend today. Uh, and we did have a lot of help in organizing this, but in particular, I'd like to thank Robert Morgan, our research assistant, uh, Maeve McGrath and Sean O'Brien, who've been fantastic on the technology side of things, without whom this definitely would not have been possible. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. So we have Adam Wagner, who is with Doughty Street Chambers. He's also a specialist advisor to the UK Parliament COVID-19 Human Rights Inquiry, as well as being a visitor professor at Goldsmiths. University London. So Adam is an expert in human rights law. Um, he's also founder and chair of the charity Each Other UK, as well as being a host of the Better Human podcast um, and has won many awards um, for uh, various activities, including uh, his, his blogs. So um, a fantastic speaker and we, we couldn't be more fortunate to have you here today. We really appreciate that you've taken the time um, and I think you're looking at the stress test of COVID-19 and how it's affected human rights institutions. So I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you so much. Thank you, Donna. And thank you for inviting me um, to what I'm sure will be an extremely interesting conference. Um, I, as um, was said in the introduction, I, I've got a few different um, ways I've been involved in this um, 
in this area, particularly COVID-19 and human rights. Um, I'm working with the Joint Committee on Human Rights and have been um, since, I, I guess, the, the end of March um, on their inquiry into the um, human rights implications of the government's response to COVID-19. And I have, um, I've, I've also been involved in some litigation, um, for example, a case about um, the right to education and the provision of laptops to children who can't afford to access online education when in-person education is no longer, um, is no longer available. Um, and I've also been trying um, on social media through my Twitter accounts, which, which is Adam Wagner one to act as a kind of clearing house for the last few months for a lot of the thinking and the issues around human rights and COVID-19, um, which you can access there. But what I'm going to talk about today is what I call the stress test, because I believe that COVID-19 has in the UK where, where I work, but also in most jurisdictions around the world, been the most significant stress test to what we might describe as the human rights framework um, for decades. Um, it's affected every area of society. It's been a classic balance of rights issue um, across all of the most important and fundamental rights from the right to family life, to the right to health, to the right to privacy. Um, and it's a good opportunity, although we are still, in fact, early days in the crisis. It seems like it's been going on for years, but it's only been going on for months. But it's a good opportunity to assess our institutions, our frameworks, our laws, to see how they're doing and how they're responding to this enormous um, and unprecedented stress test. I wanted to start um, in, in considering how we can even ask the right questions to understand what's been going on. Um, by thinking about um, the, the, the 1948 and, and the earliest days of the modern human rights framework, there you have um, Churchill, Eleanor Roosevelt, Rene Kassan, David Maxwell Fife, just some of the individuals who were central to the human rights movement. Um, and, it, and having set up a charity, when you set up a charity and apply for funding, um, I, and I'm, I imagine in all sorts of other areas of life, you are always asked, well, what's, what's the outcome that you're going for? How do you assess success? Um, what's the outcome? What will be the steps to achieving that outcome? And I, and I was considering what would have been if the, if the founders of the human rights movement had had to submit a theory of change for, to, their, um, to their funders, what would have been their outcome? Um, and, and, and this is how we can assess success. And this is what I, I was thinking might be, have been the outcome. A society where the human rights of every individual are respected, protected, and realized. Um, those are the, the three ideas, respect, protection, and realization, which I think we all probably recognize as being infused in human rights um, dialogues. But this is another way I, I, I've considered we should look at this issue. Um, and one of the, the, I think one of the failings of the legal community in the human rights field is to, to think that law is the, is the central or only pillar of human rights protections. And it's, it's natural, it's the kind of Douglas Adams metaphor is the puddle always thinks that the whole um, that it's in, it was created just for, just for them. Um, um, but the reality is that the law is only part um, of the of the picture, and, and I think there are three pillars. Institutions, um, so particularly international institutions such as the UN, the, the, the World Health Organization, as we'll hear about later, um, the, um, the, the various committees. Local institutions, um, so I, and I'm particularly thinking about local human rights organizations in the UK. We have the Equality and Human Rights Commission. We have lots of NGOs, a very sort of vibrant NGO community as there is um, in various, in different jurisdictions around the world, um, but, but also, of course, governments. And then law, we have um, international declarations and treaties. We have local constitutions and laws um, and courts and other bodies. And then finally, and this is the more amorphous um, and, and difficult pillar, but I, I, in a, a lot of my work is around human rights culture. How do you embed human rights values um, in a society so that when institutions or law don't work or they are not being or they're not working as well as they should that the population the popular society says what is going on um, and I think without 
that human rights culture, the law and institutions can become very, um, very thin and, um, and fragile. Um, and probably the best world example, the historical example of that was the Weimar Republic, where, which had excellent inst institutional protection of human rights, a very progressive constitution, um, but culturally, once a political movement came along that was saying we, we want to do things differently, that, mm -hmm. that went by the wayside. Um, so culture I put as embedded values, international and national culture and languages and language, um, so the language of rights. Um, and that's all a, a, a quite sort of long way of getting to the main um, part of what I want to say, um, which is how this COVID-19 crisis has um, stressed our human rights framework. And I want to start with just a couple of propositions. First of all, that crises um, reveal the extent to which human rights are protected across institutions, law and culture. They're a bit like injecting a radioactive dye through the system of our society that highlights exactly where all the pipes are, which ones are broken, where do they actually lead. And it's not until you push up against um, those institutions that you really see what they're made of. Um, second of all, COVID-19 has caused societies to, and it's forced societies really, more than caused, to balance and prioritise rights, um, at least in popular discourse. Um, we've had to think about, you know, I talk about from the UK perspective, you know, what, what is, just a simple question, what is a key worker? Um, uh, the, the most simple question, it's actually a question my daughter, who's six, asks, asks me a lot. You know, are you a key worker? What is it? Are they a key worker? And it's this, we, we, we've had to prioritise the, um, the, the roles that people have in society in order to, um, and, and perhaps that's COVID-19 specific, perhaps it's something deeper, but this balancing and prioritising of, right, of rights has happened um, extensively. Um, and institutions have been central to decision making on COVID-19. So what, one thing that I've really noticed is when it comes down to, when the chips are down and a crisis hits, people naturally look to the institutions of government um, of, to an extent of civil society, but really the power, the institutions of power, the powerful institutions for decisions. And it's very difficult to take decision-making authority away from those institutions in a time of crisis. So again, it makes the point that institutions, if they're not fit for purpose, if they're not up to scratch, you're in trouble. Um, I, and I just want to pick out five issues, and I'm only going to do this very briefly, but five issues which I think are common across every society having to deal with COVID-19, but engage fundamental rights in a way which really um, gets to the heart of what these rights are about. First of all, emergency laws for lockdown. Um, second of all, state responsibility for deaths. Third of all, contact tracing. Fourth, education. And fifth, international solidarity. And I'll just spend probably a, a less than a minute on each um, as I get to the end of my time. Um, first of all, um, the, the lockdown. This is my, my favourite tweet of the COVID-19 crisis. This is from a local um, UK police force. If you think you're going by going for a picnic in a rural location, no one will find you. Don't be surprised if an officer appears from the shadows. We're covering the whole county. And then there's, there's the, uh, the, 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 the shadows of the, the police officers coming for your picnic. And I think of this as the Yogi, Yogi Bear um, police tweet because he stole picnics. But the, the point about lockdown is that it, it, for the first two months of lockdown, all, I think all anybody was saying was how they couldn't believe what was happening. You know, uh, the amount of emails you received saying these, these uh, I hope you're doing okay in these, in these shocking or surprising times. Um, but lockdown where we've put limits on people's rights that we would never have expected to have in, in a liberal society had to have limited, both voluntarily and through the criminal through compulsion um, and it really is extraordinary and it really has raised this question of balance you know, how how heavy is the um is the importance of the right to health and um, when 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 um put up against 
other rights, other civil rights. Um, the, the, the responsibility of the state for deaths, th this, is, this is still really to be decided, I, I would say, um, but there will be, have to be a reckoning. Um, and the, um, there's been calls for public inquiries in the UK, at least. There will be a whole host of inquests as well. But ultimately, the, 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 the right to life it imposes an investigative obligation and, and it, I, it's difficult to imagine a more important scenario than where tens of thousands of people have died as a result of a, of a pandemic um, in circumstances where it's quite possible that they, they needn't have died. Um, it's also quite possible that, they, that it was inevitable or it was, um, it was bound to happen at least in, in, to some extent. Um, the question of who died, you know, was it why has there been a disproportionate number of people dying from black and minority ethnic communities? Why um, has the virus targeted, or put it another way, why have elderly people died in such great numbers? Um, these are all questions to be decided, but they're fundamentally important. Contact tracing, and that obviously engages the right to privacy um, versus again, the right to health. You know, We've had a very spirited debate, which the Joint Committee on Human Rights um, got involved with very, um, in, in a very overt way as to whether there should be um, a centralized database for contact tracing, whether we trust the government to hold the data um, of people's movements and contacts with other people, the most basic social data that you can imagine, where it should be held, what security um, pr provisions should be put in place, should there be separate legislation. Uh, but these are all of, of fundamental importance to the right to privacy, but also the right to health. Um, the right to education, um, again, a totally unprecedented inability for the state to provide in-person education for almost all children. Um, my son, who's nine, will be going to school next week for a day and a half, the first, day and, the first and last day and a half of in-person schooling he will have had in six months by, by the time September comes. Um, and he is not alone. There have been 10 million school-aged children in the UK who have not been able to access in-person education or have even have been able to access it, have chosen not to access it, um, or the families have chosen. Um, these are, th this is going to be, a, this is going to need a, a fundamental rethinking of the right to education um, because the case law really has not considered this kind of scenario. It's been more about anti-discrimination. Um, and the fifth issue, um, the, um, the worldwide solidarity um, human rights are meant to be universal, but the nature of this crisis has been um, individual states almost reverting to their, um, or, or shrinking back into themselves. And it's very difficult to talk about international solidarity when you can't leave your own home or you're worried about the safety, the health of your own family. Um, and this is only just beginning as this crisis rolls on and on. And something as human rights advocates, I think we need to think about carefully. So just in this final minute, I'll go back to my two original um, my two original frameworks and just think about what conclusions we can reach in these very early days. So I say it's too early to fully assess the result of this stress test, but there are some reasons to be cheerful. Um, I talked about the UK specifically. Potential good news. Um, the UK society seems to have prioritised, at least in this first outbreak, the right to health. And I say that because, and it relates to my second point, um, UK citizens have largely adhered to the rules of the lockdown. Um, and of course, there has been some threat of compulsion, an actual compulsion through the criminal law. But it has been quite remarkable how willing people have been to limit their basic personal everyday in social interactions and um, to not hug their grandparents to not leave their own house. Some people have not left their, their home for months because that's what they've been told. Um, and I think the, the idea of protecting the NHS was, the, was, the, was underlying the initial first couple of months of the government's communications and people really responded to that. Um, so that is a positive. Um, human rights institutions have stepped up in, in the UK from civil society through to the joint committee on human rights through to the Equality and Human Rights Commission, there has been a huge amount of activity and discourse and debate um, emerging from them. Um, the law has been useful, but a limited check on executive power. There's a whole other 
um, discussion to have about the legal cases which have been threatened or brought, but a number of cases have thankfully been settled by the government as they realised that their on the hoof legislating has been um, has been deficient. Um, potential bad news, my sister, my final slide, Donna will be happy to hear. Um, UK government has used executive power extensively. Um, just to give an example, all of the criminal lockdown laws um, that have been passed through regulations, which is pretty much um, all of the, the entire lockdown, have been um, passed using emergency powers where um, executive fiat has replaced parliamentary scrutiny. And that is a very significant worry um, as we go on, because these laws have literally, they released on a Sunday afternoon and come into force at the same moment they're released and nobody has seen them before. This is not a good way to legislate and has significant rule of law issues. Insti institutional protection gaps have been ex exposed. My first pillar, institutions. Yes, we have a good national health system. No, we have a bad, um, in the UK, um, social care system. And this has been brutally exposed by the situation in care homes. And that story is only just begin beginning to be told. But over 20,000 people are said to have died in care homes. Um, thirdly, the courts have been reluctant to intervene. And, and, and we've seen some of the same themes as when the um, austerity um, began in the early 2010s, that the courts have initially been institutionally very reluctant to intervene. But we may find that later down the line, they are more willing to intervene. Um, and then finally, it's still early days. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned is the fur the government furlough scheme, the, the, the almost the fantasy of the of the um, social and economic rights ad, um, proponent is the, the government paying everybody's wages while they can't go to work. But there it is. It's been happening. Um, but it's still early days. If there's a more severe outbreak or more severe outbreaks, the money and goodwill could dry up um, and we don't know what will happen next. Um, that's me. Thank you very much. Sorry for going over time by a couple of seconds. Not at all. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Adam. Thank you so much for bringing your expertise to the panel discussion today. Really um, interesting insights there, and I look forward to coming back to all of this in the Q&A. Um, did forget to mention, actually, at the beginning, just that uh, we will have a, a bell after 10 minutes and after 15 minutes. I'm just wondering, Robert, if you might, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a sample of what that sounds like so the speakers know. Uh, did you hear that? No, try again. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Okay. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Okay. Thank you, Robert. No worries. Without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Alan Green. So. Alan is a senior lecturer at the University of Birmingham. He's an expert in the area of international human rights law in emergency situations. Um, he's made some really important contributions to this discussion of late um, and actually quite impressively has released a book on emergency powers in a time of pandemic with Bristol University Press. So I understand that that's uh, just been released. So congratulations on that. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say about Article 15 of the European Convention on, on Human Rights. Um, and without further ado, over to you, Alan. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Donna. Just checking that you can see my slides. Perfect. Yeah. Brilliant. Great. Uh, so firstly, just to say uh, thanks for the... Uh, oh, I'll just set my start so that I stick in my 10 minutes and I don't get hear the bell. Uh, so... Yes, so, so just thanks to, to Donna for the invite. What I'm going to talk about today is uh, this idea of whether states should have declared de jure states of emergency in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and I explore this theme and this idea uh, in, there's kind of two forthcoming articles coming out in the, in the European Human Rights Law Review uh, and in this short book that's coming out with Bristol University Press. Uh, I should say as well, ju just in light of uh, Catherine's forthcoming uh, publication or forthcoming coming talk, that uh, I don't know how anyone who had any kind of caring responsibilities was able to do any work during this. So I was only able to, uh, you know, churn out this work because basically I have no caring responsibilities and I had nothing else to do really except sit inside for the last couple of months. And I, uh, so I think my my work at the minute has been a product of. Of, of very much a privileged position and I, 
uh, and I do need to acknowledge that. But basically, my, my, my central argument is this idea of how can we ensure that we quarantine these exceptional powers to exceptional situations? Uh, and essentially, I explore this idea through, through this concept of, of a state of emergency. Uh, and I find myself in a, in a very weird position during this, this pandemic in that I'm actually finding myself arguing in favour of de jure declarations of a state of emergency. When up until February of this year, uh, I would always, and all my published research would have been of a sceptical position of governments claiming that a state of exception exists, that a state of emergency exists because of the, of the damaging harm that that can have from a human rights perspective. And my analysis is going to focus mostly on the European Convention on Human Rights and on this idea of, of uh, allowing states to depart from the ordinary parameters of those rights uh, in time of war or other public emergency threatening the life of the nation. Uh, and my argument essentially is that this COVID-19 pandemic is almost an ideal state of emergency. This is almost the perfect storm for, for human rights and for the exact uh, conditions in which uh, emergency powers can actually be beneficial from a human rights perspective. The reason I argue that is that essentially emergency powers conceptualize, they make this distinction between normalcy and emergency. And they're conceptualizing what we call a, a dichotomized di dialectic. So basically, normalcy and emergency cannot exist at the same time. Normalcy is the norm and emergency is the outlier. It's the exception. And by allowing a state of emergency, by allowing derogations, by allowing constitutional provisions for these exceptional powers, we essentially quarantine those exceptional powers to exceptional situations. So we tend to think of emergencies as being damaging from a human rights perspective uh, and you know that that's a very like legitimate position to 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 claim particularly you know the historical uh you know impact of emergency powers you know there, there are exact conditions in which the most egregious human rights abuses uh occur and we had the mention of the weimar constitution earlier on from from adam and article 48 of the Weimar Constitution is, is you know, that, that's the, the litmus test for, for bad emergency powers. But so emergencies can damage human rights, they can damage constitutional norms, they can act as a, like a sword, damaging them, but they can also act as a shield, protecting human rights in those conditions in which uh, the threshold of, of, of a crisis, the threshold of emergency has not been reached. In so doing, emergency powers quarantine these exceptional powers to exceptional situations. Uh, I won't go into the, the different degrees of separation and, and how we make that distinction, uh, but I argue that COVID-19 and the pandemic essentially crosses that threshold. Not all constitutions, not all even international human rights treaties make provisions for emergency powers. So the, the, uh, the, American, or the, inter, uh, sorry, the African Convention has no provision for emergencies. The US Constitution, save for the suspension of habeas corpus in time of war, makes no provision for emergency powers. So we call these business as usual models. And essentially, uh, they make no distinction between emergency and normalcy. And you had this famous statement in the ex-party Milligan that the same law in war uh, applies, or same law and peace applies in war. Okay, so that might make, you know, suggest that, okay, in times of war, in times of emergency, we're going to insist upon the same human rights standards. We're going to lift human rights standards in a time of war up to that level that we see in peace. Uh, emergencies instead potentially are accommodated through the ordinary parameters of the right, for example, doctrine of proportionality. We've also seen this emergence of a different model in recent years in which we call legislative models. So essentially at a constitutional level, there's no distinction between normalcy and emergency, but the state does introduce these exceptional powers anyway, but in the form of legislation, but still a constitutional state of normalcy exists. The, the exceptionality of this legislation might be under, uh, uh, underlined through the, the introduction of sunset clauses. Uh, or, and also the manner in which the legislation has been introduced, it tends to be expedited through, through Parliament. And actually that's, that was a very common response seen to, to, to the COVID-19 pandemic, that was the UK response. It was also the Irish response. 
because Ireland, although it ha does have a constitutional provision for emergency powers, that can only be used in time of war or armed rebellion. So it's a very discreet uh, condition in which those powers can, can be used. Uh, so on the face of it, that's, uh, the business as usual model sounds attractive from a human rights perspective. However, in reality, what you end up seeing is that those rights, the rights under normalcy, are actually recalibrated downwards in the time of crisis to accommodate those exceptional powers. The, the clearest example of that, or the, you know, the most infamous example of that, is the Korematsu case in the US, uh, where essentially the, the detention of, of, uh, Jap of US citizens of Japanese descent for the duration of World War II was perfectly compatible with the ordinary parameters of the US Constitution. Now, ultimately, that was turned, uh, I think it was shortly after Trump came into office, I think in 2017. But you see that in the time of crisis, when actually the judges need to step up, there is this worrying, uh, you know, phenomenon of judges actually uh, failing to do so. Uh, in that instance, then, this is why my concern from the European Convention on Human Rights comes into existence. Do we quarantine it under or, or do we try and attempt to accommodate all these exceptional powers these lockdown powers these uh, under the ordinary parameters of rights such as article 5 article 11 or article 2 protocol 4 freedom of movement uh, or should we derogate from the convention now only 10 states in total have actually derogated uh, and i think only two in total have actually derogated from from article 5 uh, that's the right to liberty. Uh, so in my work, I do make an argument in favour of, of not using Article 5.1e. So not saying this, uh, this allows for deprivation of liberty, uh, you know, to, to uh, legalise lockdown. Uh, make this argument because one, it would be the only uh, limitation on the right to liberty under Article 5 that is not dependent upon the conduct of a person or upon a, a, the specific category of person. And that's important because we have these different procedural safeguards in place when depriving those individuals of their liberty. Those restrictions are, would be entirely absent for, for, uh, the, for lockdown of, of everybody, the deprivation of liberty for everyone. So that's problematic. We come into this other area of whether it, it, it constitutes restriction and deprivation of liberty. Uh, and again, I think the court is probably most likely to say it's, a, it's going to be a restriction rather than a deprivation. Uh, again, I think that's problematic because if Article 5 isn't used at all, and there are, there's no potential control or limitation, maybe not so much on that power in this instance, but potentially beyond this pandemic, beyond this crisis. Article 2 of Protocol 4 and the right to freedom of movement may come into play. However, it's important to note that the UK and Turkey have not ratified this. So we would potentially be uh, legitimating or enabling lockdown powers, not just for this pandemic, but for other crises that are less objective. Okay, and I think by accommodating it under these ordinary parameters, for example, proportionality, etc., it leaves these powers free to be applied in situations beyond the pandemic. And I fear we're essentially being seduced by the objective nature of this pandemic crisis, of this emergency. Uh, I, you know, and I, I'm, I don't want to attack the necessity of lockdown powers. I'm all in favour of them. I'm just worried about whether the manner in which they're being introduced and all these different restrictions on individuals can be quarantined, can be limited to, uh, to the pandemic, or will this create either a, you know, a judicial legitimation of the power and similar powers beyond the pandemic? So there's my bell, so I'm going to try and finish up uh, quickly. Uh, so what I would just say briefly is, is to think about whether a pandemics are actually an objective state of emergency. And I think at the beginning, yes, they are. Okay, and we're, it's very easy to be seduced and attractive by this. But it's important to note as well that emergencies tend to trigger other emergencies. And it's at this point, identifying when the emergency ends, when the emergency is being perpetuated, that we get the, the risk of human rights abuses. So this, uh, this uh, pandemic emergency has already triggered a global economic crisis, okay? And these are the precise conditions in which you get social unrest and 
in turn state responses and potentially egregious human rights abuses. And I, I don't think it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, I suppose, uh, oh God, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't think, think it, uh, it's a coincidence that we've had the, you know, huge protests at the same time that we've gotten this done on unemployment. Uh, and in that instance, if we have these powers that are allowed under normalcy to deal with the pandemic, can we limit them to those crises? What about these potential crises and social unrest that might come as a result of this unprecedented global economic crisis? Uh, this is just to conclude about whether emergencies are an effective way of confronting crises today. The argument very often is, well, emergencies were empowered uh, and inspired by uh, the Roman dictatorship of the Roman Republic, and it was useful for dealing with crises like, uh, you know, the kind of armies that they faced. It's not so useful for terrorism today. Uh, in this instance, though, so, so that is something to be aware of, or should we accommodate them under business as usual models, legislative models, etc. I argue, ultimately, we should use the de jure state of emergency, uh, because we, we have to ha have all the tools available to us to ensure that we can quarantine these powers to exceptional situations. Uh, and the risk is maybe not so much these powers themselves becoming perpetuated and entrenched, but maybe similar powers being enacted for less objective emergencies, or perhaps for, th for these powers being perpetuated to deal with potential social unrest that might arise out of this, you know, severe economic crisis that's coming up. Uh, and finally, just I can, I can understand why there are symbolic objections to declaring an emergency, because you are potentially sending out that signal that you're departing from human rights standards, you're lowering human rights standards, and that might cause concern and worry for people. But I think that overplays law's ability to shape and frame debate. And we know from, from research on emergency powers that it's actually the opposite that occurs. And it's actually executive and political power labeling a crisis as such that actually influences uh, the judiciary and other subsequent actors. And we also know that support for lockdown measures and conformity with it has actually been, you know, the key uh, test in that has actually been things like very clear messaging from the government rather than actually any worry or concern perhaps about the government stating that, that we're, we're suspending uh, your, your human rights. Uh, so I'm going to leave it at that. And sorry if it was a little bit rushed uh, at the end. So thank you. Cheers. That was excellent. Thank you so much for that, Alan. Really compelling presentation. And again, thanks for bringing your expertise in so many issues that arose uh, in your presentation as well as Adam's come up throughout um, the day and, and throughout the conference. So hopefully we'll be able to, to re-engage on these as we go through. And I see uh, Professor Ayal Benvenisti has been on since, since we started. So just wanted to say you're very welcome. Hello. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce our next esteemed speaker, uh, Dr. Kath of the wonderful Transitional Justice Institute in the University of Ulster, as well as being a senior lecturer in human rights and international law at Ulster University School of Law. Um, Catherine is an expert in a variety of areas, particularly within international human rights law, and has an interest in the gendered implications um, of COVID-19. And that's something that I think you will just discuss with us today. Looking forward to that. Just to note as well that um, Catherine has recently published a book. Uh, it's coming out in four weeks. Um, so congratulations on that. It's called Women's Rights in Armed Conflict Under International Law, and that's with Cambridge University Press. Um, so again, very impressive to get work out uh, in these difficult times. So I'd like to hand the floor over to you, Catherine. Thank you. Thanks to Donna and to TCD and SLS um, for the invitation to participate and in what's already been a really interesting discussion. Um, so Donna mentioned I have a, a new book coming out and I should say that I wrote that long before the pandemic. Uh, <laughs> but um, what that book looks at is um, really the protection of women's rights in armed conflict under international law, under what's now a very kind of fragmented uh, system of protection. And, and uh, the book looks at that more closely. And um, my comments today sort of speak to that a little bit because I want to suggest that uh, the dynamics around COVID-19 
uh, specifically the delay and inaction of the Security Council in responding to the pandemic, I suggest that they may that those dynamics may have longer term implications for feminist engagement with international law more broadly. Um, in particular, the way that much of that engagement does tend to privilege the Security Council within global governance. So the gendered implications of COVID-19, um, in particular, in terms of uh, increased exposure to gender-based violence um, and the gender division of increased care work, um, they have secured um, considerable prominence really in public debate and in global governance um, discussions about the pandemic. And I think it's, and indeed, if we look at the UN Secretary General, um, he accompanied his call for a global ceasefire uh, with a call to end gender-based violence and called on governments to ensure peace at homes around the world and to put women's safety um, as first as they respond to the pandemic. So that sort of centrality of um, gender, gender implications, I think, does evidence some success of feminist messages in international law and global governance. And indeed has even, I think, more optimistically led to calls for, for a feminist recovery from the pandemic. Now, as someone who sort of works primarily um, on gender conflict and international law, what's really kind of been interesting to me about um, feminist responses and engagement around the pandemic and international law is, um, uh, is this the central positioning of the UN Security Council in many of those calls for response and change? So for example, um, Madeleine Rees, the General Secretary of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, has uh, written a kind of widely circulated call on the Security Council. What on earth is the Security Council doing? Um, the NGO Working Group on Women, Peace and Security issued a joint statement calling on the Security Council for a resolution. Um, the Group of Women Leaders, Voices for Change and Inclusion, uh, which includes a number of prominent international women leaders, um, such as Helen Clark, Margot Wallstrom, Navi Pillay and others, um, they wrote an open letter to the UN Security Council president uh, calling, again, calling for a resolution on, on the pandemic. Now, what I th the, um, what this reveals, I think, is, well, first, I think this, this point I make about the central position of the Security Council in feminist engagement with international law. And I want to suggest that that impulse to sort of look to the Security Council um, is not, not new with the pandemic, rather it's grounded in sort of over two decades of feminist prioritization of the Security Council as the institution uh, best place to advance women's rights and participation in an insecure world. And that's of course sort of epitomized by campaigns uh, for Security Council Resolution 1325 and subsequent resolutions dealing with this women, peace and security agenda um, that have a 20th anniversary this year. Um, but also interestingly, um, the look, the turn to the Security Council um, is also reveals, I suppose, the, the reading of the Security Council in action and the sort of failure and delay around adopting a resolution um, as an unqualified failure to meet its mandate to respond to threats to um, international peace and security. Um, but of course, we have now um, had a resolution just two weeks ago, uh, Resolution 2532 was adopted by the Security Council um, to respond to the pandemic. And I want to suggest that the deficiencies of that resolution, which I'm going to speak further to, um, they have, um, although certainly not about feminist engagement, they have sharpened dilemmas that are confronted by feminist engagement with international law, and especially the Security Council, um, dilemmas that have been going on for some time. Um, so for example, the resolution uh, and its failure to even reference the WHO, even in the preamble, um, does I think raise questions about sort of is the resolution uh, is, is resolution 2532 a type of fragmentation strategy, uh, whereby the institution that actually has resources and authority to respond to lead a global response to this issue is um, distracted from by the Security Council and, and, and attention and resources are displaced from WHO to the Security Council. Um, there's also a question of sort of UNSC Security Council mission creep with this resolution. So uh, does the Security Council adopting a resolution around a pandemic reflect the securitization of a public health issue? Um, and then even I think in, in terms of um, the feminist engagement with the Security Council, I mean, even as on the narrowest terms, uh, looking at that resolution 2532, whilst it does in its final um, operative paragraph reference women, it doesn't reference the Women, Peace and Security resolutions um, 
at all. Um, so in that sense, the Security Council had opted not to endorse its own normative commitments around gender equality and not to activate its own infrastructure around that. Um, so ultimately, I think the, the weaknesses of the resolution on the whole, because it is overwhelming, it is a rhetorical, largely rhetorical resolution. Um, the, on the whole, it does, I think, reaffirm suspicion that the resolution was really um, rather than about coordinating a global response to the pandemic, was really about the Security Council uh, and its own legitimacy and it being seen to do something um, in order to justify um, its own existence and activities. Now, these problems with the Security Council as manifested to, through Resolution 2532, these problems of fragmentation strategies, of securitization, of efficacy and legitimacy, um, they are familiar problems in feminist engagement with the Security Council. In fact, uh, I would suggest they define much feminist analysis of women, the Women, Peace and Security resolutions. Um, but what Resolution 2532 addressed to the pandemic does bring, uh, however, is new clarity about the underlying reasons for the repeated and enduring nature of these problems at the Security Council. Um, specifically, the COVID-19 quote unquote crisis is powerful in exposing the deficiencies of the crisis framework which the UNSC traffics in. And here, um, you know, obviously critique of international law's crisis tendency is not new. Um, it was articulated most forcefully by, in 2002 by Hilary Charlesworth um, in Modern Law Review in her seminal article, International Law, a Discipline of Crisis. And Charlesworth's argument um, that the focus of international lawyers on crisis has shielded the discipline from more fundamental questions and inquiries um, has acquired, I think, uh, further resonance in light of the pandemic. Um, and just to, to reprise um, Charlesworth's key arguments, um, she talks about uh, the contentious construction of crisis and the ethical costs of crisis. And in terms of the contentious construction of crisis, uh, she talks about the negotiability of facts so an initial, uh, the crisis model in international law tends to assume that elements of the crisis are quote unquote facts that are uncontroversial and ripe for picking. Um, but of course, uh, that is I'm critical, I will tell you that's not the case. Um, so for example, uh, UK, um, excuse me, uh, UK tabloid newspaper headlines talking about the first lockdown killings, uh, which refer to women who were killed by male, violent male partners under lockdown. Um, that's not a new phenomenon. Two women a week die in the UK uh, at, uh, at the hands of violent male partners. Um, she talks about the lack of analytical progress. So um, by treating crises as new, it leads us to rediscover issues constantly and to analyze it without uh, building on past scholarship or learning. So COVID is characterized as a new problem rather than a manifestation of, for example, um, the well-established effect of capitalist development models um, and indiscriminate damage to the natural world. Um, she also talks about the problem of, of thin description. So uh, the crisis focus leads us to concentrate on a single event or series of events and often miss the larger picture. Uh, so the problem becomes about the PPE shortage or, or China's lack of disclosure, um, rather than the immiseration of, of public services and, and the social state. Um, and in terms of the ethical cost of crisis, um, the focus on crisis narrows the agenda of international law, she argues. So the only possible courses of action um, in the face of crisis is to act or, or not to act. So either the Security Council adopts a resolution or it doesn't. But of course, there's so much between those two poles. Um, and what about the range? Um, and also that approach um, insulates the ultimate resolution from critique. Um, the silence of crises, how crisis is silencing to many other voices. And here I, I do think a bit about what China is attempting to do in Hong Kong under the cover of the pandemic. Um, and also how crisis restricts the substance of international law. So the characterization of crises and the Security Council role means that whilst the Security Council can mandate country missions to account for COVID-19, it can't address any of the structural underpinning problems um, to the pandemic and its causes. So whilst feminist um, prioritization of the Security Council for two decades plus has, has preconditioned an approach to um, the Security Council for COVID-19, uh, it, it privileges the Security Council, um, that actually that privileging of the Security Council concedes the crisis characterization um, of the pandemic. And um, I want to conclude just by arguing that to concede the crisis characterization is in fact antithetical to feminist recovery. And um, here, instead of looking to international actors, um, I look locally uh, where 
I've been uh, witness to sort of local conversations amongst women's organizations and, and act, feminist actors developing um, an extraordinary feminist recovery plan. And I contrast that discussion um, led by local feminist organizations that, that rather than um, emphasizing the crisis and discontinuity caused by COVID-19, instead the emphasis um, in those discussions has very much been on the social and economic precarity that characterized the pre-COVID-19 world and that predetermined the gendered vulnerabilities that international organizations are now calling attention to. And that I want to argue that recognizing this pre it is in fact recognizing this pre-existing precarity that has underpinned calls for feminist recovery, um, in particular around revaluing care work. So um, perhaps I think in terms of the, in the longer term, in terms of um, feminist engagement with the international law, um, it does seem to me that COVID-19 and its crisis framing has, I think, exposed the impoverishment of the Security Council as an agent for women's rights and gender equality. Um, and um, prompted me, and I know others, to revisit Charlesworth's exhortation to, instead of focusing on crisis, um, to refocus on an international law of the everyday, uh, to forge a role for international law um, in enabling a feminist recovery. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. We're so fortunate that you were able to attend today. That was really stimulating discussion on feminist engagement with the Security Council, such an important issue. And I do hope we can come back to this discussion in the Q&A. And um, so thank you very much again. Um, and without further ado, we will move on to our next speaker, who is the excellent uh, Professor Shane Darcy. He is a professor of law and deputy director of the Irish Centre for Human Rights um, with the School of Law, NUIG, um, National University of Ireland in Galway. So Shane is going to talk about business and human rights, um, obviously uh, an expert in international human rights more generally, um, but with a, a fantastic knowledge and expertise of business and human rights um, and how that operates and is affected by COVID-19. So very much looking forward to that. Over to you, Shane. Uh, thanks, Donna, for the overly generous introduction. But uh, thank you to you and to Robert for the invitation to participate and to, to May for her technical assistance in setting up the, the event. So in this paper, I'd like to discuss the challenges and prospects of expanding the role of international law within business and human rights, which is a relatively new but burgeoning thematic area within the contemporary international human rights system. Business and human rights seeks to complement but go beyond really the long-standing efforts of the International Labour Organization and its centerpiece at present at the international level remains the UN guiding principles on business and human rights which were endorsed by the UN Human Rights Council in 2011. These can be described as a, an international policy document perhaps even soft law which draw on existing human rights law to emphasize the state duty to protect human rights. Um, but taken with the second pillar, which is the corporate responsibility to respect human rights, they attempt to move beyond corporate social responsibility, which has dominated the issue of ethical ethics in business for, for many decades. But they haven't been fully able to abandon, abandon voluntarism, in part because of the absence of an underpinning legal foundation for that second pillar. The third pillar then emphasizes access to remedy for victims, outlines barriers and various mechanisms that could realize this right, which remains elusive in practice. So the guiding principles since their adoption have spurred limited, mostly European national policy and legislative efforts, but considerable attention from the private sector, from consultancies and from civil society. Early dissatisfaction with the guiding principles which came about at the end of a six-year mandate of UN Special Representative John Ruggie, prompted a number of states to push for an international treaty on business human rights. And civil society organizations have been galvanized by this development, while also backing efforts to enshrine in national law and policy key components of the guiding principles, including the concept of human rights due diligence, uh, which is advancing within Europe. It has to be said, Germany just announced today that it is developing a mandatory human rights due diligence law for businesses. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has really highlighted many instances and examples of the challenge of ensuring that companies respect human rights. And by implication, the limited impact of the conventional business and human rights approach to date, arguably failing 
the stress test which Adam laid out in his, in his first presentation. For UN High Commissioner Michelle Bachelet, the pandemic has exposed and exacerbated the inequalities and vulnerabilities that are present in most current business models. So we can find prominent examples, of course, of companies taking appropriate action to protect their employees during the pandemic to main and maintain their employment, often with state supports, as well as contributing to research or frontline efforts, such as by repurposing manufacturing to provide for PPE or hand sanitizer. There are also many instances of companies acting in ways which have harmed human rights. For example, high street clothing brands have canceled contracts in their supply chain, leaving many millions unemployed, mostly in poor countries without social safety nets. Places of work have pro proven abusive, particularly for women, and at times lethal for COVID-19. Textile factories in Leicester, Amazon distribution warehouses, meat processing plants, and those working at sea. In the oftentimes unilateral rush to acquire PPE, ethical procurement and the exercise of due diligence by states seems not to have been prioritized. There's also another range of human rights concerns associated with the private sector at this time. Access to treatments and vaccines, data protection and privacy in the context of contact tracing apps, misinformation on social media, increased role for private security in detention and quarantine facilities. It's been reported that some corporate law firms are gearing up to take countries to investor state dispute, and se dispute settlement over measures taken to address COVID-19. That business practices and public health can be at odds during this pandemic was encapsulated for me in the statement on overseas travel by the Irish Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Tony Holan, who said, listen to us, not the airlines. So in this context, what we've seen is the working group on business and human rights, who have a spe specific role in pursuing the implementation of the guiding principles, they said, the human rights and economic consequences of the pandemic have demonstrated an, a dire need for better safeguards for vulnerable workers in both developed and developing worlds, but also for consumers and all members of society. But there's been no broad multilateral push as of yet to ensure such safeguards. That being said, we have seen some, some developments which I'd like to discuss in, in a little detail. First of all, recent moves towards mandatory human rights due diligence. I already mentioned the case of Germany today. The Office of the High Commissioner has described due diligence as a key tool in the global efforts to build back better. The European Parliament adopted a resolution in April saying that human rights due diligence as well as environmental due diligence are necessary conditions to prevent and mitigate future crises and ensure more sustainable value chains. And the European Commissioner for Justice has indicated that the EU is to move towards legislation in this respect which will take a, a vaunted policy prescription uh, and make it a legal obligation, at least in certain countries and at least for certain businesses. There is strong civil support for this direction. Just last week, 100 Catholic bishops called for mandatory supply chain due diligence now more than ever, and also called on states to engage constructively and actively in the ongoing negotiations on a business and human rights treaty. In the context of COVID-19 and international trade, Francis Fitzgerald, who's a, an MEP and a former Irish Minister of Justice, had a surprising suggestion, given her party's record in this respect, saying that a business and human rights treaty could address the recurring environmental and labour concerns associated with the international trade system. Now, in contrast to this proposed EU mandatory human rights due diligence, which can draw on the guiding principles, the emerging domestic legislation, developing corporate practice, as well as related EU directives and non-financial reporting, the proposed Treaty on Business and Human Rights faces far greater hurdles. The muted EU legislation is likely to come to pass in some form because of the smaller number of states involved, its relatively narrower focus, and a large research project would indicate the failure of voluntary approaches in this context to date. Uh, efforts to elaborate and enshrine the human rights of obligations towards business uh, in an international treaty have faced considerable state and private sector recalcitrance. So going back 20 years ago, the proposed draft norms in this context were pushed aside by, by John Rogge's mandate. Current efforts, however, have a stronger institutional footing given the 2014 resolution of the Human Rights Council, which established 
the open-ended intergovernmental working group with the mandate to elaborate an internationally legal binding instrument to regulate in international law, in international human rights law, the activities of transnational corporations and other business enterprises. So this has been spearheaded by Ecuador, supported by, supported by South Africa, uh, and backed by a treaty alliance of over a thousand civil, civil society organizations. The language of the resolution, creating an internationally legally binding instrument, really demonstrates what the motive is behind this particular initiative, although it's been accepted that the treaty can sit in complement to the guiding principles and other, and other initiatives. State participation has been patchy to date. The sixth meeting is due to take place in October. We're going to see a third revised draft uh, this month. The EU and the US have not fully taken part, whereas other big countries like Russia, China, and Brazil have participated. The considered involvement of civil society has seen the process described as international lawmaking from below, with both the participation and the frustration that that brings. So what are the challenges that this treaty process faces? There's been debates over the scope of the treaty. Should it include all human rights or only gross violations? Should it cover transnational enterprises or all business enterprises should address state obligations or also codify direct human, human rights obligations for companies. As the process has been unfolding, we've seen the presence of the private sector within these negotiations, a powerful cohort that hasn't really been present in other human rights fora, although obviously have, have made their presence felt in international trade and investment law contexts. So the treaty seeks to create state obligations as it stands towards business enterprises rather than elaborate new rights or new protected groups, so to speak. It's more concerned in many ways with the actor rather than the acts, um, which for some is a departure too much from previous human rights treaties. For others, it's the next logical step in that respect. The treaty, it has to be said, is trying to deal somewhat comprehensively with matters that have only been briefly addressed in previous human rights instruments, if at all, which has led to a state of stasis, really, it's not been welcomed by, by a number of states and by, by business enterprises. Um, so going back as far as 2014, John Ruggie was warning against the idea of a treaty, uh, particularly a silver bullet or all-encompassing treaty. Business representative organizations expressed their preference for a, the consensus approach of the guiding principles. And there was a, another resolution adopted when the Intergovernmental Working Group was created pushing for more national implementation of the guiding principles. To overcome this sort of state of stasis, uh, Claire Methvin O'Brien has recommended that it should simplify matters, uh, this is the working group, and develop a framework treaty, a broader framework treaty based on the guiding principles, because states are unclear as to the purpose of the existing treaty and are unconvinced of its legal and diplomatic viability. Writing in the American Journal, she said, parties on all sides now need to show a greater readiness to compromise that has been observable so far. Proponents of the treaty will not be persuaded. They already see the guiding principles as a compromise, as an outcome that achieved consensus by lacking sufficient bite. Um, while the guiding principles have put business and human rights more firmly on the international agenda, they have not done enough, particularly to advance access to remedy for victims. So just to conclude, the third revised draft of the proposed legally binding instrument will reveal if there's been any fundamental rethink and overhaul of the instrument's form or whether the existing draft will merely have been finessed and refined. The latter, my sense is, is to be more likely as the proponents will probably be keen to produce a text that approximates a final draft, perhaps with a view to convening an international diplomatic conference. If that is the trajectory, it does face an uphill battle to get sufficient state support, barring a considerable turnaround, not only for the text to be agreed, but for then to be signed and rat ratified in sufficient numbers and by the main home states of the world's, the world's largest transnational businesses. The reality of COVID-19 may prompt domestic or regional responses to better ensure human rights and business, but the climate at the international level seems too hostile and divided at present for any meaningful uh, agreement on such an international treaty.
Now, in this context, advocates for an enhanced role for international law and business and human rights should take care not to overlook the existing human rights treaties and oversight bodies, some of which have engaged deeply with business and human rights. The Committee on the Rights of the Child, the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights have all been active in this area, seeking to prompt domestic policy and legislative action in this area. They have an important role to play in this context, irrespect, irrespective of whether what for some is the holy grail of a treaty, irrespective of whether that can be reached or not. Uh, this is a space that is going to continue to develop and generate significant debate. Uh, thank you for your attention and I look forward to further discussion in the Q&A. Shane, thank you so much uh, for that very engaging discussion on business and human rights. We're going to be coming back to the question of non-state actors throughout this conference, uh, particularly in Ayal's presentation and in Sharifa's presentation thereafter. So hopefully you'll be able to come back in and have that discussion with us during the Q&A. So thank you again. Very fortunate to have you. Um, and our next speaker is um, Mr. Dr. Even Jason Ruddle, who's a, an assistant professor of public international law with Leiden University. Um, very accomplished scholar and has recently published two books. One is Compensation for International, sorry, for Environmental Damage under International Law, and that's with Rutledge, that's 2020 publication, as well as Altruism in International Law, which is a Cambridge University Press publication and is forthcoming. Again, some of the issues you're going to touch on today, um, although your, your overall theme is environmental law and how that ties in in the pandemic context. Um, but again, this will also tie into what IL will speak about later, particularly issues of new generation or non-adversarial mechanisms in environmental treaty regimes, as well as the need for a more integrated approach uh, in environmental decision making and one that takes account of public health considerations. So I won't give too much away. Um, really looking forward to your discussion, Jason, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Donna. Um, can you see my slides okay? Excellent. Thank you. Um, yes, my presentation today um, is about the, the natural remedy for zoonotic uh, diseases, uh, though I hasten to add that I haven't found some miraculous uh, homeopathic uh, medicine. Um, but I would like to make three fundamental points today. Uh, first, explain why uh, biodiversity and genetic variety are important to prevent zoonosis and zoonotic diseases. Second, uh, to suggest that international environmental law uh, has failed us and failed to protect us from such diseases. And third, uh, to offer a few potential uh, solutions to remedy um, the problem with environmental regulation. So a bit of background uh, on the importance of biodiversity and genetic uh, variety. Most infectious diseases in humans are actually zoonotic um, and new infectious diseases uh, emerge on average every four months. Environmental uh, changes are in fact one of the uh, principal factors uh, that cause viruses to jump um, from the natural world. Um, and these environmental changes are actually usually caused by humans, by land use changes and urbanization and, and so on. And the loss of biodiversity that, that results from such um, environmental changes uh, lowers resistance to pathogens that might be circling in the uh, natural world because genetic differences help to slow and, and stop the spread of um, pathogens and, and viruses uh, within nature. But our critical line of defense uh, against zoonosis, biodiversity, is in uh, decline. And in fact, the intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services reported only last year uh, in its uh, global assessment uh, 
that since the 1970s, um, there has been a decline in 14 of 18 uh, of our essential biodiversity and ecosystem services. And that includes the role that uh, nature and ecosystem services play in regulating and stopping the spread of uh, diseases. So the main causes, as I alluded to, of biodiversity loss are habitat loss through urbanization or, or industrial activities, the introduction of uh, invasive species, uh, pollution, uh, over harvesting, or intensive uh, agriculture, which can result in what's known as the monoculture effect, this narrowing of genetic uh, variety. And of course, um, uh, climate change exacerbates uh, this problem. In fact, the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change has uh, cautioned that changes to our climate can degrade crop yields, uh, change uh, habitation patterns and migration patterns, and among other things, brings animals in the natural world into closer contact with humans. Um, so this is the case, for example, with, with bats that is thought to be um, one of the, the origins of the novel coronavirus. So uh, this is uh, something of a sketch of the problem uh, that, we, that we face. And I want to suggest today that uh, part of the problem uh, has been the failure of international environmental law. There is actually a, a curious uh, paradox because while the formal protection of biodiversity through international environmental law has really expanded, that's evident not least by uh, the number of treaties that we have, the number of protected areas that are now covered um, and lists of endangered uh, species. As we've seen, biodiversity nevertheless continues to decline. So there's really a problem with the way that international law uh, regulates our environmental uh, concerns. And the main problem uh, I want to suggest to you today is that international environmental regulation too often frames the environment in an instrumental way. That is really with a view to uh, its continued uh, exploitation for short-sighted anthropocentric uh, purposes. And this is really a, a structural bias um, that can be traced back to the origins of international environmental uh, law. And it's sort of been replicated by a process of um, path dependency. And I'd like to just give a, a few quick examples to, to illustrate my, my point. First of all, the, the no harm rule, which is really the cornerstone of international environmental law and uh, dates back to the uh, early 20th uh, century. This rule, although it's expanded somewhat with the prevention principle in, in recent years, it only really captures environmental damage that has an observable uh, impact across an international frontier into another state or beyond the realm uh, of national jurisdiction. So that can exclude uh, profound damage that uh, is caused to ecosystems and, and biodiversity from the uh, view of, of state responsibility. And the rule also divides up uh, ecosystems for sort of convenient and abstract jurisdictional purposes. Second uh, is the concept of sustainable development, another uh, cornerstone concept uh, in, in international environmental law. A close look at its definition and application uh, in various multilateral instruments really reveals that um, it often prioritizes uh, economic growth over biodiversity concerns. And we can go into to details in the discussion if uh, people are interested later. Third, um, it's important to mention the Convention on Biodiversity of 1992. This, of course, does uh, attempt to preserve uh, diversity in, in species and, and ecosystems. But Article 2 of that convention starts to reveal that its principal objective is sort of defined uh, with a view to exploiting uh, the benefits of, of biodiversity. And all of the biodiversity obligations within it are qualified with the caveat 
uh, as far as possible uh, and as appropriate. Fourth, um, the protection of uh, wildlife under international law is regulated uh, through the prohibition of uh, cross-border trade in endangered species rather than uh, preservation and conservation in situ um, or the criminalization of uh, illicit trade in wildlife. It's important also to mention the, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species um, of Wild Fauna and Flora, the CITES uh, Convention. This is, this is problematic in, in a number of ways. Um, and I think just to, to illustrate my, my point here, um, even though CITES prevents trade in uh, no less than eight uh, pangolin species, uh, these remain uh, illegally uh, trafficked uh, and in fact are the uh, most illegally trafficked non-human mammal um, in the world uh, and are of course thought to have been the intermediate host of the novel uh, coronavirus. Our approach uh, to wildlife and, and, and conservation is, is often uh, influenced by sort of early approaches to, to environmental regulation. Uh, the regulation of whaling or the protection of fur seals, migratory birds, these were all early attempts at regulating environmental issues. But they were done at that time to uh, protect and preserve the economic prosperity that was associated with those uh, species. So for example, the whaling agreement of 1937 uh, provides that uh, whale stocks were to be conserved um, to, and I quote, uh, secure the prosperity of the whaling industry. And finally, um, I'd like to suggest that reparation for environmental damage uh, rarely accounts for the intrinsic or inherent value of ecosystems and, and biodiversity. Recent valuation methods uh, adopted by courts and, and tribunals have significant blind spots and they really fail to account for things like carbon sequestration or biodiversity services that the environment uh, provides to us. So we need to reevaluate our relationship with nature and we need to ensure that our protection of the environment uh, recognizes that we are an essential part of the environment uh, not above it. We must uh, embrace the so-called One Health approach, um, which places an emphasis on integrating uh, public health uh, concerns in environmental uh, decision making. The effective uh, protection of biodiversity, ecosystems, and the natural uh, resilience of the environment should really be at the heart of our regulatory efforts because prevention is always better than cure. Um, even from an economic perspective, stopping the spread of pathogens before they emerge from nature uh, is much less costly than pandemics. Prioritizing short-term profit uh, from harmful industrial activity or saving costs through lowest common denominator regulation are really false economies. So I'd like to suggest uh, a few practical reforms that, that could be made. And the first approach I'd like to suggest is that we should um, embrace ecosystem uh, approaches. Um, effective ecosystem approaches require states to protect both land and water resources from degradation. They recognize the many threats um, to ecosystem integrity, and they promote comprehensive protection and uh, preservation. They demand a consideration of the entire systems of living resources and uh, recognize the interconnected nature uh, of the natural environment, uh, as well as the impact that human activity uh, can have on uh, nature. And good ecosystem approaches can be seen in, in some of our uh, legal regimes. Um, so those that concern the global commons, 
Antarctica, for example, or international uh, water resources, um, have some good models that, that should be developed and, and propagated, extended to, to other areas. Um, and environmental impact assessments um, are now a requirement of customary international law, uh, but there is no uh, consensus uh, around the, the, their content. Um, and at the very least, um, they should take account of critical ecosystem services like uh, disease regulation. Now, another idea for uh, reform is to elaborate rights of nature. Um, famously, Christopher Stone in the 1970s asked, uh, should trees have standing? Uh, and many states are beginning to say yes, um, and they have embraced within their own legal systems um, the rights of nature. So we can see this in Ecuador, in New Zealand, in Colombia, and a number of other places. Uh, for example. Now these rights uh, place an obligation on uh, the state to protect those rights uh, from being breached by exploitative uh, economic uh, activity. And rights of nature could be litigated uh, in domestic, uh, regional uh, or international uh, courts. And that may help to solve some of the implement implementation challenges um, that are associated with so many uh, environmental problems. We also need to deal with um, the illicit wildlife uh, trade. Um, and I mentioned that CITES, uh, the convention that regulates wildlife trade has many shortcomings. And one idea that has been uh, suggested uh, in particular by John Scanlon, the former head of CITES, Secretariat is that a protocol uh, ought to be added to the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime uh, to deal with this issue. And finally, we must recognize nature's uh, inherent and intrinsic uh, value. Individual organisms, uh, species, ecosystems, uh, and the biosphere. Uh, all have value uh, by virtue of their existence um, and intrinsic value uh, because they are self-realizing, they preserve their own integrity, their resilience and, and their own health. Uh, inherent and intrinsic value is referred to in some conventional practice. We can see it, for example, in the preamble of the Convention on Biodiversity, but it's often hortatory uh, and that is quite the case for the Convention on Biodiversity. Better examples can be found once again in uh, the context of um, Antarctica, the 1991 Protocol on Environmental Protection to the Antarctic uh, Treaty is a, is a good model. Uh, it really recognizes the intrinsic value of uh, Antarctica and defines what this means. Um, and it also goes on to detail that human activity uh, should not have a detrimental uh, impact on ecosystems, species of fauna and flora, uh, as well as the biological significance of um, Antarctica. But uh, intrinsic and inherent value uh, could also be operationalized uh, through more inclusive techniques uh, for calculating uh, compensation for environmental damage. Now this may be complex, um, but various methodologies have been uh, proposed, tariff systems, um, environmental remediation funds, uh, and others. And such value, intrinsic and inherent value, could also be uh, promoted through innovative schemes that incentivize uh, sustainable land use and uh, agriculture. The EU's new uh, farm to fork uh, food policy uh, will be supported by uh, a legal framework and is a good example uh, of a regime that specifically seeks to reverse the loss of uh, biodiversity. So with that, um, I'd like to, to conclude, um, but I'd just like to say in conclusion that coronavirus was uh, a warning from nature. Uh, it wasn't the first warning. BSE, 
um, SARS, uh, swine flu, and many others testify to that, but it could be the last warning. And how you choose to interpret that, uh, I think gives an indication of how willing we, or more accurately our uh, political leaders, uh, are to make the change that is required. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jason. Thanks for that insightful examination um, around zoonotic diseases and an international environmental law as it relates to the pandemic. Um, I had meant to say, Jason, we met um, originally on the editorial board of the Trinity College Law Review. It was clear to me at that time that you would go on to do fantastic things. So I have to say it's a pleasure to be working together again. So thank you so much um, for that. And again, hopefully we'll come back to that in the questions and answers session. I actually can see a question on the Q&A for you specifically there. So we'll address that uh, once the time comes. And for now, I would like to, I'm delighted to hand the floor over to Lea Reble. Um, so Dr. Reble has just published a book called Human Rights Unbound that's been published with Oxford University Press. Um, Dr. Reble is a, an expert in international human rights law and has a particular interest in socio-economic rights, economic, social and cultural rights um, and today is going to look at the difference between ter extraterritorial obligations in the socio-economic rights context um, versus um, the importance of distributive justice and, and the prism of distributive justice as opposed to a rights protection approach. So without further ado, I'll hand the floor over to you, Leia. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for having me and for this very kind and generous introduction. Um, I am talking today about uh, international human rights law and COVID uh, from the perspective of extraterritorial human rights obligations, so um, not uh, so much um, about economic and social rights as such, so it's more, it's more about the extraterritorial aspect. In particular, I would like to address um, limitations of the framework of thinking of um, uh, international human rights law and extraterritorial obligations um, when it comes to the sharing of resources and that's, that this is true even for um, economic and social rights. Uh, I would like to start, or I will start with an example of a claim that we could make about resource sharing um, and then I will unpack this claim um, with a few um, definitions such as jurisdiction and what an extraterritorial uh, human rights obligation is and so on um, in order to then uh, argue that in fact extraterritorial human rights obligations are not a good way of, of addressing or thinking about the sharing of resources internationally. Um, so just to set up the discussion States have different levels of resources. And the pandemic has made this very, very obvious. Um, many states uh, had problems sourcing um, PPE and ventilators and so on. And uh, I want to address one kind of argument that has been made um, in response to this fact. Uh, so one claim that has come about or that I've seen um, during the rounds once the pandemic hit Europe in particular um, was the claim that human rights obligations, in particular the right um, to health as it is found in the International Covenant um, on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the ISESCO for short, um, requires states um, to assist their poorer or less equipped counterparts um, with resources they already possess. So this claim might take the form um, of saying uh, the right to health requires China to send masks to Germany, or it requires Germany to send ventilators to Italy. Um, and it uh, becomes apparent that these two claims are about the sharing of resources, prioritizing where resources go because they're needed. Um, and this is coupled with the fact that these resources are not only needed, but they are also A, about, and B, relatively scarce. So there are quite a lot of resources, 
not to cover everything, but to cover more than they currently do if they were distributed more efficiently or more fairly um, even. Now, um, if it is true that the right to health requires this sort of resource sharing, then that uh, would mean that this claim that China has to send masks to Germany would establish what is known as an extraterritorial human rights obligation. Um, by this, I mean a obligation that is owed by a state to an individual that is outside of that state's territory. Now, I want to unpack this claim a little bit and check whether uh, it really does establish such an extraterritorial um, obligation. Um, and uh, I want to argue that it in fact does not and that this is a limitation of human rights law in this um, specific case. But that does not need to worry us so much because there are other ways of addressing um, this issue that is um, no doubt pressing. Now, um, I think I will argue that instead uh, of extraterritorial human rights obligation, cases of um, cooperation to share relatively rare, rare resources are better addressed by um, the framework of distributive justice, both global distributive justice and distributive justice within political communities. Now, let me explain um, why I think that is. Extraterritorial human rights obligations are usually conceptualized to be a matter of jurisdiction. Um, jurisdiction here means something slightly different from um, other areas of international and domestic law. Um, specifically denotes a relationship that a state needs to have to an individual in order for human rights law, human rights obligations to apply to that individual. So the state has a relationship with an individual and then owes human rights obligations because of that. Um, now there are different uh, um, accounts of jurisdiction. Some, they, some say um, an individual needs to be uh, within the physical power of a state or its agents for this to be established. Others say political power uh, is enough. Um, I'm included in those others. Um, and then there are different accounts of what, what each of those terms mean. But that's um, not, not so important for our purposes here. Uh, what we need to know is that there is this threshold relationship that is generally accepted and it is even accepted um, in relating to the ISESCAR, even though unlike other um, human rights instruments, it does not mention jurisdiction. Um, but it is accepted particularly as it concerns positive obligations. So the provision of resources would be a positive human rights obligation. So this is clearly um, the example that we're looking at, the sending of masks or ventilators, the sharing of these resources is clearly within the ambit of that. And so um, this is a matter of jurisdiction. Um, now, is this claim a reasonably convincing claim, actually, to say, well, if you have masks and you don't need them, you should send them where they are needed. Does this mean this is a challenge for jurisdiction in international human rights law and for extraterritorial obligations in the sense that we should abandon jurisdictional criteria? Now, I don't think it is. Um, and in order to explain why I don't think it is, um, I want to say something about why this jurisdictional relationship is present in international human rights law as a requirement. Um, I think, and I argue in my book, that it is an expression of the fact that claim rights, like human rights, in order to be operationalized, need a specification not only of the right holder and the duties, but also of the duty bearer. So we have quite a lot of um, issues to address. We need to know exactly he, who needs to do what before this can take effect in practice. International human rights law and the instruments that um, recognize it do not do that. Um, so for this, uh, we need public institutions. We need public institutions to do that. And now this is true for human rights as standards of treatment, so offering equal treatment or offering non-discrimination. 
But it is even more true if we think about sharing resources and prioritizing where they go. In fact, it becomes more difficult if we now not only have human rights um, that sort of secure a minimum level of treatment or a minimum level of resources, but if we now say, well, resource amounts change and opportunities change and we want to allocate them fairly, that's an ongoing process and it's even more complicated than allocating duties and rights uh, the way human rights do. So if jurisdictional relationships are about the specification of duties and duty bearers in this way, and this process is more complicated for distributive claims than it is for human rights claims strict to sensu, uh, strict to sensu, then this is the jurisdictional threshold, if there is one, needs to rise, not to fall. Jurisdiction is more difficult to meet because it is a more difficult thing to do. Um, but that's not, I, I think, a very good way of thinking about this. So it would be better, I think, to get rid of the jurisdictional puzzle altogether. Um, and there is a way of doing that, namely to say, um, well, the jurisdictional puzzle relates to the individualized nature of human rights and it relates to them as minimum standards specifically. Um, but if we decouple resource sharing from human rights claims and instead acknowledge, well, there will be two sets of claims of distributive justice. One between political communities, so between Germany and China or Germany and Italy, um, and then within political communities, again, when we decide how these uh, resources are allocated. Now, if we decouple that from human rights requirements, that opens up a lot of possibilities. Many, many claims can be made suddenly that we couldn't make before. For example, we can specifically say there is um, a, there is cooperation between states and cooperation between states um, cannot possibly rely on, jurisdic on jurisdictional relationships because it goes beyond the political community by, the, by its very definition. That's what cooperation does. Um, so we don't need to worry about that. And I would suggest that's a, that's a good thing for us. Um, and then in addition to that, um, contrary to what human rights law and human rights do, claims of distributive justice are much better at generating maximizing requirements. They are better at generating maximizing requirements because, requirements because we can say, well, yes, human rights provide this minimum, this floor, but then if it's also now suddenly about a fair share of resources and opportunities, this might be much more than the minimum human rights provide. So we should embrace this potential of distributive justice talk and say, well, maybe human rights and distributive justice should, um, should exist alongside each other. And we should, we should be honest about that. And we should, um, we should, we should say that and we should embrace this possibility. Um, I want to say just before I conclude, um, this does not mean that human rights do not have a role to play. They do. Um, I think a lot of um, the presentations here today, the talks today, um, have brought this truth home that, of course, they have a contribution to make. Um, but I don't think it is a good idea to, uh, to, to use them to crowd out other normative discourses. Um, that's the first uh, thing I wanted to say before concluding. And the second one is that it, uh, it doesn't mean that these obligations of cooperation and resource sharing are not also to be found in international human rights law. Just because something says it's an international human rights instrument does not mean that all the obligations found therein must necessarily work along uh, the parameters of how we understand uh, human rights to work traditionally. So these are just two caveats before um, <laughs> Um, people think I, I don't like human rights. That's not, that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, and uh, in conclusion, I think what this thinking about the difference between human rights and uh, distributive justice suggests, not just for COVID 
the emergency, the pandemic, but in general is that uh, acknowledging the limits of human rights might be beneficial. It might be beneficial and it might also, and this I think leads quite neatly to the next time slot where global governance is a, is a topic uh, or is the topic of interest. Um, it might provide guidance for where we take global governance and what we do with it, because of course, if we have resource sharing between political communities, that also needs to be guided by principles and these duties also need to be specified and global governance would be one way um, of doing this. And I would suggest that this would be an important task uh, for global governance initiatives um, to uh, embrace. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Leia, for that excellent presentation on the distinction between extraterritorial obligations and distributive justice. Um, you're, I forgot to say, you're actually tuning in from the, the School of Law at the University of Glasgow, where you are a lecturer in public law. Um, so very fortunate to have you here today. Thank you. And as you say, that does transition perfectly into the next time slot where we're going to talk about health and global governance, the World Health Organization, um, and many other topics uh, related to international law. So thank you for providing that transition for us. So we have a little bit, bit of time for questions. Um, I'm going to go to the Q&A sidebar here. I have a question, first of all, for Jason from Aaron Wu. Thank you for posting this. So it asks, um, says that he, he, he's finding your presentation very informative. But could it be that rather than being a failure, as you have observed, that international environmental law was never in fact designed to succeed? Difficult question. Well, any thoughts on that, Jason, or shall I pass it on to someone else? And um, thank you, uh, Aaron, for the for the question. Um, I think maybe I was being uh, provocative, but uh, uh, I mean it. Um, um, perhaps these are two sides of the the same the same coin. Um, what I, I think perhaps is, is a more accurate characterization is that um, we haven't got the, the, the calculus uh, right. International environmental law has had to uh, balance many uh, interests in the past, um, the protection of the environment versus the exploitation uh, of the environment. Uh, we now see more clearly uh, the cost of not getting that balance uh, right uh, and as I mentioned, it is a false economy to prioritize uh, exploitation. And I think this cost, this new cost that we're now more, much more aware of, needs to be uh, properly internalized uh, in our approach to environmental regulation. You know, often our uh, approach to environmental regulation is kind of characterized by this dichotomy between anthropocentrism or prioritizing human interests and eco-centrism. Uh, uh, prioritizing environmental interests. I think this is a this is a false uh, dichotomy. Perhaps um, these things go hand in hand, and it's it's a, it's about uh, balance. Um, and we must now recognize the the critical role that environmental ecosystem and biodiversity services play in regulating the world uh, around us, particularly regulating disease, stopping and spreading uh, pathogens. The optimist in me um, would suggest that uh, scientific understanding uh, is evolving and uh, that legal regulation should uh, and can catch up. Apologies for that delay, Jason. Fantastic response and thank you for that. Would anyone else on the panel like to come in on that? And a very challenging question. Well, we'll move on in that case. Uh, thanks again for addressing that for us, Jason. So, Shea Hazel commenting on Leah's presentation notes that this was a thought provoking conversation on resource sharing and the jurisdictional puzzle. Does Dr. Rayblay foresee international criminal cases regarding distributive justice in sharing of global resources during pandemics such as COVID-19? Um, very difficult question. And uh, if you prefer to defer that uh, to, to later on, no problem at all. Any thoughts on that, Leah? <laughs> 
Um, yes, thank you so much for, for the question. And uh, so I've actually had the opportunity to read the question while, um, while it was up earlier. So I did have a, a second to think about, but it is a very challenging question, particularly um, for me, because international criminal law is not my area. Um, so with that caveat, um, uh, up, just keep that in mind as I go. So um, in international criminal law is about individual responsibility. So holding individuals account for the violation of international law norms. Um, and my thoughts here were mostly about duties of states, um, just because that is the states are, and public institutions more generally are uh, the primary duty bearers in international human rights law. And um, I would think in international or global distributive justice as well. Um, but having, so, but that doesn't exclude this possibility. It's not, it's just not something that I have thought about. Um, and then the International Criminal Court, the ICC, if this is what the question is, that is about really, um, uh, so I, I would encourage whoever asked it to, to clarify if that's what, what they wanted to know. If this is what the question is about, also has jurisdictional limits. So um, it would need to be a violation of an international law norm that qualifies as an international crime. Um, that would need to be listed in the Rome Statute. and. Um, so uh, given my knowledge of the Rome Statute, which is again, uh, quite precarious, I would probably say that no, I do not envisage international criminal law cases on this issue, which does not mean that it might not be a good idea anyway, but this is not something um, I, I have thought about. Um, thank you. It's, it's so interesting. Thank you for that response, Leia. Um, it's something we might even come back to when Judge Howard Morrison comes online later, uh, so he's with the ICC. Um, but fantastic to, to get that response uh, from someone with expertise in another field, because that's what this is all about, is about engagement between different areas. So thanks for that really interesting um, reply, Leah. I think we have a third question here. Yes, so from Sahar Ahmed, um, thank you so much for this incredibly insightful discussion. I was hoping to ask Dr. Ruddle, unfortunately, you're under the spotlight again, Jason, a question following on from his presentation. Does he think that perhaps engaging with permaculture societies and the debates around them might prove to be more fruitful? I'm particularly thinking of involving them in relation to the international environmental law mechanisms. Um, Sahar is tuning in from Trinity College. Any thoughts on that, Jason? Thank you. Yes, uh, um, I suppose just just quickly, uh, um, I would welcome certainly broader participation in environmental decision making and, and law making uh, generally. So, uh, you know, I, I think certainly, as I as I hinted at in in the previous answer, um, we need to reevaluate uh, our relationship with nature. We need to reevaluate this balance between uh, the protection of the environment and the exploitation of the environment. And I think including more voices um, in that discussion through more participatory uh, mechanisms um, would be would be welcome and, and uh, you know would would be a, a, a good solution. Thank you, Jason. Excellent um, reply and. In terms of, we don't have any other questions here in the sidebar and the Q&A, but would any of the panellists like to ask questions of each other and to have a discussion in, in that format? Shane, hi, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks to all for the, the great, really thought-provoking presentations across a range of topics. Uh, Leah, I had a question for you about the idea of extraterritorial obligations concerning burden sharing. Um, I wonder how you see this playing out in the in the coming decades, say, because we see over recent years really a, a greater push in terms of extraterritorial obligations more generally. So a relatively small beginnings of people directly in the control of state agents outside their territory, expanding to include territory and some recent general comments from the Committee on Economics and Social Culture Rights talking about states having extraterritorial obligations vis-a-vis -vis their businesses that operate overseas, the Human Rights Committee as well in some of its decisions as well as in general comments talking about a, a more expansive approach to extraterritorial obligations. Um, so I wonder, might it become a, 
a natural trajectory given the way we've seen it progressing so far. And the other question I want to ask is about what about the colonial context? So you referred to cases between Italy and Germany or Germany and China, et cetera, but you know, is there a more of a case in the context of former colonies um, developing in developed worlds? Does that not you know, create a greater moral, if not in some sense legal obligation to, to share resources? Thanks, Shane. Another really difficult question. Leah, would you like to come in on that? Uh, thank you, Shane. It's uh, nice to meet you, um, sort of. Anyway, um, I'm just writing down um, what you said, and then I will take your questions in turn. Take your time. So you said, um, rightly, uh, that there has been uh, a more expansive push um, rela relating to um, extraterritorial obligations or ETOs in the human rights context, and that's true. And I think that's generally to be, to be welcomed. Actually, as the world gets more interconnected, I, I would say that this is probably also a bolted horse, as they, as they say. So yes, um, I would see the trajectory um, like just as you described it. Um, and uh, about the burden sharing in uh, colonial in the colonial context. So this is where I think. Um, addressing the issue explicitly as a justice, as a distributive justice issue is actually beneficial because it allows in a different way, in a more effective way than human rights do, to take into account past injustices. So I don't have an answer to how we specify principles or how we best specify principles on uh, burden sharing or uh, global justice. Um, I am more about the distinction between uh, distributive justice and human rights and to say, well, to have a, um, a good moral and legal repertoire, um, it, it's a good idea to keep them separate and to sort of to emphasize their, their strength, their respective strengths. And um, so if we incorporate distributive justice into our discourses on this, then the colonial context might actually um, start to figure more prominently and um, I would have thought that's a, that's a good thing. I would have thought it provides an, an excellent avenue to say, well, but there are past injustices. And so even if now you don't have so much more, you are still required to share more because of that past injustice. So that's a very rough outline. Um, that's an argument that human rights as such, and as we understand them in international law, do, they do not allow you to make that. So I would I would have thought that's a further advantage of what I've of what I've argued for today. Thank you, Leia, for that excellent um, reply. I have one question in the Q and A. There, I think we have time for one more, and then we'll take a five minute break before the second time slot. So from Nora Salem, uh, again for you, Leia, if you don't feel uh, too much under pressure here. Um, so, Dr. Leah, beyond the obligation to adopt containment measures resulting from the right to health and life, would you agree that there is an obligation to adopt mitigation measures to protect the socioeconomic rights of the most vulnerable groups, including women resulting from the European Social Charter? In other words, do governments need to adopt financial packages to compensate the exacerbated negative effects of COVID-19 for women and is there a, possibly even a duty of international cooperation related to such an obligation? A very complex question there. Thank you, Nora Salem. Um, would you like to come in on that or will I pass that over to somebody else, Leah? Um, no, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to answer that. Thank you very much um, for, for this uh, question. Um, so again, caveat, European Social Charter is not, um, is not my specialism, um, but it is uh, generally accepted that um, that socioeconomic rights, just like any other uh, human rights in international and uh, European law, impose both negative um, and positive obligations. And the positive obligations that um, Nora, if I may here, calls mitigation measures to protect uh, the socioeconomic rights of the most vulnerable groups. 
um, including um, economic packages, uh, there are avenues to make that argument. Um, if I want to be cautious and say I have not thought about this fully, so I would not want to say yes, definitely there is such an obligation. Um, but there are avenues to make this argument for sure, and um, uh, it's. Uh, the financial packages, again, yes, there might be good arguments to be made uh, in a human rights context and to say, well, if certain people, vulnerable groups, for example, fall beneath a particular floor, beneath minimum core requirements, minimum core obligations um, is a concept from economic and social rights scholarship and doctrine, then yes, these economic packages uh, may well be a question of human rights duties. But it is also possible to say, again, um, because these groups are vulnerable, their fair share of obligations, so in a distribu distributive justice talk, again, um, maybe should be higher than it is for more resilient groups. And so, again, I would cautiously say, yes, there are good arguments to be made in the human rights context here, and to say there are, there are human rights duties uh, imposed. But again, that the distributive justice duties here would offer, I think, even more, um, uh, even 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 more opportunities to discuss this more fully. Um, so it's the same it's the same uh, question again of having more than one moral and legal tool. Um, I just generally tend to think it is better uh, to have um, a hammer and a screwdriver rather than just a bigger hammer. So that's that's what what I would say. Um, I think I see in the question list um, a, a, a question for Al. No, this has not been. Never mind. Um, thank you for the question. Very interesting. Sorry. Thank you so much, Leah. Yeah, um, there are a couple of other questions there. All right, and we're hoping to come back to those in the the second Q and A later, um, unless any of the panelists would like to come in on what we've just discussed. Um, we will take a break. Is there anyone who has anything pressing they'd like to bring up? Okay, so what we might do is take a five minute break and then we will start the second time. So thank you again to Leah for providing that perfect thematic transition into the issues that we're dealing with from two o'clock onwards. So if we take five minutes now and come back together at two um, Dublin time, see you then, thank you.